Well, that's great that you know what you want, you know, and that you're able to articulate that. I, th there are so many people who don't even know to ask themselves the, those questions. And so I really admire the fact that you, you. Um, stuck to your plan. I kind of have to, and I, I appreciate you saying this, but again, um, you're, you're older than I am. I'm 45. I turned 45 uh, this year. So I had so much focus on acting, 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 acting over the past uh, three years where mm -hmm. I literally lost uh, jobs that were paying me $200,000 a year at my IT business uh, because I was so focused on acting. And it was, wow. I, I need to create this, uh, I need to create this structure that will give me the, the right timing so I can go to auditions and not feel bad. I need to do all of these things. I started a business, you know, COVID uh, helped uh, that business not be uh, uh, stable, but mm -hmm. we did everything to kind of align it. And it came to a head where, you know, my wife, who I've been, we've been married for, uh, it'll be 21 years next month. Mm -hmm. um, she basically has had so much of the instability already. Mm -hmm. Where she said, listen, you know, one more of these cycles, uh, I'm not going to be going through it. And in, then you, you have to ask yourself a real question, right? I'm 45. I'm in Chicago. I have two great kids. I have a wife who I love. Is acting going to be my full-time endeavor? And do I need to put everything into it? Or do I need to make other adjustments? And mm. during COVID, I started the show because mm -hmm. I just wanted to talk to people. And instead of taking workshops, I wanted to talk. I wanted to ask people questions. And people who are in the industry, who are casting directors and directors and producers and actors mostly, and have a conversation. So I can learn and the, you know, uh, the audience who's going to be viewing this can learn and get better during this mm -hmm. time we're just sitting and not doing anything. Mm -hmm. um, and as I started doing the show, the more I started doing the show, the more I realized that the acting uh, fix that all of us are after, I am getting it from here. Mm. And I don't, wow, this is not the end all be all. And I still envision myself uh, in the, what I call the James Corden model, uh, <laughs> which is you have a talk show, the season is over, you go and you do a, a film project or you do mm -hmm. you know, some things. I still see myself doing that, but that became the trajectory. And for me to have my fledgling IT business, which I'm trying to uh, build through COVID, uh, being a parent uh, of, of the two kids, of a 16 year old who just started driving my daughter and my, oh my God. you know, 11 year old in, in a few days son. Um, being with my wife, who's a CFO of a company and dealing with all of the, you know, nonsense that she has to go through. Mm. And then adding all of that instability on top of that, because I need to go and do an audition for something that I don't really care about at the moment. Mm. I, it's, it's not worth it. Um, so I'm not giving up on acting, but I'm putting acting in a, in a different uh, part of my life where if the right opportunity presents itself, I am I'm doing it. But I will be a lot more um, selective as to what it is that I will be spending my limited amount of time on. So right. still love it, still will be doing it. Uh, acting is, you know, I'm an actor. I'll be doing it for the rest of my life. But I am no longer, I kind of made that choice a few uh, months ago that acting will no longer be my full-time focus as the top priority. So it moved out, yeah. now everything gets realigned. So. Well, as somebody who never thought this was going to be my path, somebody who never dreamed that this was even possible, um, <laughs> who didn't go to school for this, I, you know, I think I learned very early on mm -hmm. that there are a million different ways to be in this business, actually to make it in this business. Mm -hmm. And it all depends on what your goals are, what satisfies you. Like you said, mm -hmm. what is satisfying that, um, that need, you know, what is giving you the juice mm -hmm. um, that inspired you to be in this business. And that's different for a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, early on, I met people who, you know, had, full-time jobs and were 
some of the best actors, singers, dancers that I, I, I know. Um, I, I met people who didn't live in, you know, one of the big media hubs, New York or Chicago or Atlanta or LA, um, who were still some of the most um, accomplished actors that I've ever met. Um, and so, you know, I, I have never really pursued this in, in terms of um, uh, like where I have to live, how much money I have to make. Um, I, I have to be a star. Uh, I have to be the lead. I want to be the preeminence, whatever. I, it's really truly about the project and whether it interests me, whether I think it's contributing to a conversation that I want to have. Um, and so, you know, um, uh, 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 I've just let, uh, that's what I decided when I was interviewing with agents mm -hmm. many, many years ago. I, those were the kinds of questions they were asking me. What do you want? What do you want? And those were the kinds of answers that I gave them. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really only in articulating that out loud for me, for myself, that mm -hmm. I was able to just go, okay, I can be poor right now because I'm doing something that I really um that, that really is satisfying and stimulating and um, that feeds me in other ways yeah. than food and money and a roof over my head. But for me, are just as important. Yeah. Um, and, and it's gonna be, the answer to that question is gonna be different for everybody. But um, mm -hmm. if you don't ask yourself that question, you could be the most successful person in the business and still not be satisfied because you're not where you really wanna be. Yeah. Yeah, and that's um, um, that's a lot of the people. You know, they're so focused on this, and they're so driven, and they've invested so much time into it mm -hmm. that the mere idea of asking themselves that question is already perceived as failure, and they lock oh. that door and they don't wow. go there. Um, and we have to because it becomes it becomes that drug and you're completely addicted uh, where you become so tunnel vision that mm -hmm. you're not really uh, are present in, in your current circumstance and uh, able to make rational decisions. So I, I think everybody has to be asking themselves that question, whether they and, decide, and, yeah. And, and, sorry, and, and, and there are so many people who, um, through their training or through um, uh, preconceived notions of how to make it in the biz, yeah. um, uh, uh, don't give themselves the authority. Um, and you know, this is all that we have. Yeah. Th these are our tools, all right here, yeah. in here. And um, it's the only asset that we have it's how we do our work. It's what we have to offer. And yet people, um, when I talk to young students in, in, in classes occasionally, mm -hmm. more often than not, the, the question that they ask is, how do I know what my type is? How do I perfect my type? Right. How do I present that type? Um, and I'm like, you're looking for other people to make that decision for you. And, and what you need to be doing is asking yourself, yeah. You know, who you are, what you want, what makes you weird and unique and strange, and how can you use those as assets? Um, how can you, when you go to audition, you're basically introducing yourself. How do you introduce yourself if you don't know who you are, you know, and what you want? And, and yes, their notes, their perceptions are important. They, they, they are the gatekeepers. They're the people with the power to hire and fire and all of that kind of stuff. But your opinion needs to matter at, at least as much um, because otherwise you're never going to give um, them an honest performance. Um, uh, and, and so you just, you have to keep in touch with um, how you're feeling and what you want at any given time. Yeah. 
Uh, by the way, everybody, we're speaking with, uh, with the wonderful Francis uh, Jew. Thank you for tuning in. And we're talking about acting. We're talking about life. And we're talking about how to uh, make sure that you have both, because that's that's kind of the uh, the balancing act in this world. Yeah. Truly, truly, I I think um, the the I just switched agents. Actually, I, I have a, a new agent, and um, they asked me, you know, what kinds of things I see myself um, succeeding at. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if, if there are so many, I, I'm not one of those people who believes that anybody can play anything, that if you're skilled enough, you can play anything. Mm. Um, I heard a story once about, oh, I, I don't know whether it was Maggie Smith or somebody who said, you know, the great actors can play three different kinds of parts and the very best actors can play four, you know, because each of us are limited by, you know, our capacity for understanding ourselves, for our physical capacity, um, uh, for our emotional capacity. Um, and, and so part of our job is to keep pushing those boundaries of um, uh, who I think I can be, or at least what I'm capable of. Mm -hmm. um, I just finished playing um, a mass murder and war criminal in a play called Cambodian Rock Band by Lauren Yee. And it's a brilliant play. Uh, um, and one of the things that I had to do was portray this guy who was a math teacher, but who also wound up running a prison camp during the Khmer Rouge genocide. And he was responsible for torturing and killing tens of thousands of people. And yet he was just this ordinary guy. Yeah. And um, uh, I, I, I think my job in that play was not to get people to judge him, they were gonna do that already, right. but to understand how much we, all of us, are capable of these things, given the right circumstances and given you know, the choices that we make in life. And so, um, yeah, I think that our job is not to say, what's my, what's my type? What, what's the niche in which I can work? Um, as much as how much of life do I think um, is this frame capable of embodying? Yeah, you know? it's, it's a perfect way of looking at it because again, many people do fall prey to how am I being viewed and why am I only viewed in this reference? And you're really limiting yourself because it doesn't matter. Right, mm -hmm. you you will know what your type is by what you're being asked to audition, but mm -hmm. you know whether you choose to own that box and then try to expand from it is more of a technical approach. Mm -hmm. um, but choosing your projects and right now there is a plethora of opportunities. So if you don't want to, or if you if you feel like you're not getting the roles uh, or the auditions that. Uh, represent who you want to be viewed as make your own or go wow. do yeah. indie, or or go do a student film and uh, and take that role and show to the industry that you're somebody else uh, mm -hmm. or you're more than what they thought you were you're, you're not limited in any way so the uh, limitation of what is my type is your own limitation that you're putting on yourself by taking the choice away from you and mm -hmm. putting it on some arbitrary people for whatever reason. So yeah, don't worry about any of that. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in my career worrying what other people thought of me and chasing people who were making it plain in one way or another were not that interested in my whatever. And um, I, I, it took me a long time to um, simply go, well, this is my path, and these are the people who enjoy what I do, and so why not focus on that? Why not get better at that, you know, and not waste my time and my energy? It takes so long um, to recover from auditioning for something that I don't really want, you know? So yeah. why not just say, I, I, I don't feel right for that. I'm not going to be helpful for that. So I'm not going to go in for that. Yeah. 
and I think that's that's the healthier choice. And you know, to extrapolate that example and just use it in terms of life in general, mm. um, that's the right approach. Why are we chasing people who don't care about us? Well, mm. Why are we trying to change their opinions of us and try to prove that we are better or different or you know uh, somebody who they don't perceive us as? Why? Uh, right. Let's just be happy with who we are and the people that are around us that actually appreciate us for who we are. And yeah. we, we have nothing to prove. And that's, that's the reality of it. I think we also have to be realistic with ourselves. Mm -hmm. That we have to study ourselves well enough and honestly enough to say, you know, I'm not a tenor. I'm a baritone. But I'm going to be the best baritone that I can be. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to study this, you know. Um, let's say I want to be a, a, a great dancer. But I know that I'm not, if I'm honest with myself, mm -hmm. I'm not ever going to be, you know, dancing with the Royal Ballet in London, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pursue, you know, the dance that I can succeed in and see how that goes. You know, whatever that is, um, the, there are, there are, if, if, we, if we are honest enough with ourselves to identify those areas where we can improve and you know i'm living proof that there are plenty of areas where we can improve <laughs> you know then you're always occupied you're always um uh acting uh, and studying acting because you can always find stuff that, that to, to work on yeah and um you know for those who are who are kind of listening to this and just to uh just to you know kind of put a, a finer point on it if you're thinking that means that, you know, if you know yourself, you're automatically putting some sort of a limit around uh, what you can and cannot do, that's not, uh, that's not it. That's just saying, be focused on yourself, be focused on getting better at who you are, and you're not limiting the potential of opportunities that will flow your way. They will come or won't come on their own. What yeah. you can do is be the best you and continue working in that direction. Everything else will happen on its own. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. Um, because again, it's, uh, I, I don't want people to say, uh, well, okay, th that does that mean that I, I'm going to give up or does it mean that I shouldn't be, uh, you know, striving for something? No, not at all. It just, you know, it, it's like me right now at age 45, I'm a pretty good tennis player. So does that mean that Wimbledon, uh, you know, is in my sights? It is as a as a spectator, uh, certainly, and you know I can get tickets. I, I've gone to Wimbledon and uh, done the inside tour, which was amazing, and I wow. went again with my children. But you know, do I set my sights on training every day just so I can potentially get to Wimbledon as a professional? It's it's not it's not a, a goal that's um, that's realistic, and, and that's <laughs> that's that's the part, right? So. Uh, you mentioned voice. I love singing, and my range is uh, is a bit of Swiss cheese, where it's a it's a nice range, but there are lots of holes in it. So for me to present myself as a singer, and even though I love doing musical theater, for me to go and try out for those parts that will require the range that I don't possess mm. is, is is futile. Right? So I can work and I can become better with what it is that I'm able to uh, do with my voice and learn how to breathe better and you know, uh, manage control and know how to go from head voice to, uh, to you know, chest voice. All of these things I can get better at, but I know that I am not going to be Pravarati. Uh, that's, that's just reality. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm terrified. Of singing, I get asked to sing occasionally, huh. um, but I'm I it, it's one of the most vulnerable things mm -hmm. for me, honestly. It, mm -hmm. It's it's terrifying for me. So knowing that, um, I found a teacher, mm -hmm. um, a, another singer who I really admire, who is a student himself, is continuing to learn all mm -hmm. the time, and he has an em enormous beautiful, flexible voice. And so I started studying with him 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it, it's really gotten me through a lot. Nice. Yeah. Um, and you have, again, you've done a ton of theater. Uh, I know you as the, you know, former minister Chen, and I definitely want to spend, uh, you know, some time on one of my favorite shows ever, but I had no idea of just how much theater, uh, experience you have. And that, that's, you know, where, uh, if, if I, if it's fair to say, I think that's the bulk of, of your experience. I think you spend more time on stage than on screen. Um, mm -hmm. what drew you to theater? uh in general what what was the the starting point where you said this is me i want to be on stage um well theater was um really my first um it, when i was little I, I grew up in san francisco mm -hmm. in a big big family i have nine brothers eight brothers and sisters there are nine of us total mm -hmm. and we weren't a theater going family but we used to put on shows in the living room for each other, just, you know, singing songs, telling jokes that we'd seen on TV, yeah. um, uh, goofing around, all, all of that kind of stuff. And we'd force our, the rest of our family to sit and watch. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was 12, 13 years old, my old, one of my older brothers was in a high school production of The King and I. Okay. And he was playing the prince. Mm -hmm. And the only other Asian person in the show as I recall it, was playing the king. Everyone else was not Asian, but when we went to go see it, it, it was just the most beautiful experience. Here were people, kids, who were making me believe that they were adults, that they were Siamese, that they were kings and teachers and parents and who were genuinely crying at the end. And it, it just fascinated me that they that they were able to do that and um i wasn't just moved um, as a shy kid who couldn't speak to people i was so shy and so um insecure i was fascinated by how they did it by the craft of it it, it seemed to me a real spiritual exercise and there is something about theater where you're live in, in a room together with people and things are happening that you know uh, i think are transformative uh, if they are really honest and um you can make people feel things you can think about things in a safe environment that in real life somebody who was shy and really down on himself couldn't really articulate in his in, in my own life so so um uh, uh, not being in a theater going family, I, I dreamt of going to that high school and being on that stage. That was, that was it. That was my yeah. whole, um, uh, picture of what the business was. And, um, I got introduced when I, uh, um, went to that high school and started auditioning, um, to shows that I, I just didn't know before that, uh, getting introduced to ideas and, and theories and movement and um, and all this kind of, and and our drama teacher Peter Devine was just a, a, a task he was disciplined and there was um, but the the reason why he had in, enforced such discipline was because he believed as I do now that there's a real spiritual relationship. Um, there's a responsibility that you have to the story, to your characters, um, to um, the author, um, to the audience. And that, that's a relationship that you, you have to um, nurture and, and take care of. So, so um, I, was in the course of musicals um, in uh, high school, My Fair Lady, um, Oliver, and then I went to college and I studied English Lit. Because if I studied theater, my parents would disown me. That was one of my questions, yes, thank you. <laughs> they were not, uh, they, they knew that I spent a lot of time and energy on uh, performing. Mm -hmm. uh, so they said, you know, when you go to school, first semester, 
no extracurricular activities, including theater, because we need to know that you can take care of yourself and, and get good grades. Mm -hmm. So I did that first semester, second semester, I was in there, I was auditioning, but, but still only in the chorus, you know, because I, I couldn't dare speak, uh, just read a line even, that just terrified me. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, give me a song to sing, show me some steps, I could do them. Um, I was taking class, uh, a ballet class on the side, extracurricularly, um, while I was in school as well. Um, and then I'm a junior in college and somebody that I had been in school with had already graduated and was in New York playing audition piano for the first revival of Pacific Overtures. Okay. Um, and he called me out of the blue and said, how are you feeling? How's your voice? You want to come to New York? We need a boy in the tree. We can't find one here in New York. So I was like, um, uh, oh, okay. So for the very first time, I took the train from New Haven to New York. He mm -hmm. picked me up at Grand Central. I sang a little of um, the Dutch Admiral, a little boy in the tree, a little pretty lady. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, I'm cast in this show and commuting to and from school mm -hmm. every day, um, uh, rehearsing at night, uh, rehearsing on weekends and then performing, you know, um, uh, in this showcase revival of Pacific Overtures. And, um, and then on closing night, Steve Sondheim comes to see the show wow. and he convinces um, uh, the Schuberts and uh, McCann and Nugent to pick up the show and for a commercial run. So I took a year off of school joined Actors' Equity, which I had no idea what it was, um, but I knew that I had to in order to do this show, and, or that's what I thought, and um, suddenly I, I'm off Broadway, and I've got lines of my own, I've, I'm singing solos, I, you know, and I'm, and I'm in a group of Asian American actors, all of whom are making it in the business in one way or another, mm -hmm. which blew my mind. Yeah. Um, Still, I thought, you know, this is too risky for me. So I went back to school okay. for my final year, um, after which I went back to San Francisco and was working at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation um, in the education department as a secretary. Mm -hmm. When suddenly a casting director who had seen me in Pacific Overtures called me, she had gotten my number from Equity, and she said, I'm casting, um, I need a new understudy for M Butterfly on Broadway. We don't know when B.D. Wong is going to leave, but when he does, his understudy will take over and we'll need a new understudy. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm coming through San Francisco. Will you audition for me? I, I thought, well, it'll be good practice because mm -hmm. um, I was still doing shows at night while working, mm -hmm. um, still maintaining my equity membership just because I would get a bill every six months and I'd pay it. So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I auditioned for her. She gave me some notes. And then months later, she called me again at work and said, we're having callbacks at the end of the week on the stage of the Eugene O'Neill Theater on Broadway. Can you be here? And I was like, I'm a secretary in a nonprofit AIDS yeah. organization. I can't afford that. Yeah. Who's paying, you know? And she put me on hold and in a couple of minutes, she got the producer to pay for a flight, a night in a hotel, a free ticket to see the show the night before, and I got to audition the next morning. So at the end of the week, I find myself flying to New York. I see the show that night. I'm making notes on all of the blocking um, in, in a notepad on my lap in the dark. Um, I practice all night. Uh, I hardly get any sleep. I get up the next morning and suddenly I'm on a Broadway stage and I'm thinking this is never going to happen again. So I might as well just enjoy it and work. Let's, you know, that's, that's one of the things I think um, I've always had in my corner is that it's never been about, you know, the hoopla and about mm -hmm. fame or money or, or any of that. It's what's always excited me was just working yeah. and figuring out a scene and, and stuff like that. So um, I do um, four scenes from the show. And the, afterwards, the casting director 
um, says, thank you, you made me look good. You remembered the notes that I gave you and you responded really well to them all. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And a couple weeks later, I got a call again at work at the AIDS Foundation and they said, you have to come to New York by such and such date and um, here's what we're paying you and we'll pay for the flight, but you need to find a place to stay and blah, 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 blah. So that was back in 1989 when I quit my day job wow. and suddenly I'm on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And then I go on tour with the national tour of M Butterfly mm -hmm. and eventually on tour, I take over the role and um, I come back to New York after that. I interview with a couple of agents that I was introduced to by other members of my touring company. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I have not had a day job since. Um, I've had times when I was really, really poor. Um, I've had times when I was really, really flush. But, you know, it's always been about just... Um, seeing, trying things on and, and having fun doing that and doing my own study of how, how to make it work. Um, um, gradually, uh, uh, my agents, my former agents now, um, introduced me to casting directors who um, got me some, you know, small guest appearances on things like Law and Order mm -hmm. and um, The Good Wife. And, um, and then, and I never dreamed, I never aspired actually to working on film or television. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I was doing a, uh, an off, off Broadway show, making like 200 bucks a week, something like that, yeah. um, in rehearsal, way downtown on Wall Street. And this was like real, like everybody does everything kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but a fascinating new play by Taylor Mack that I, I just adore. Uh, and um, my agent said, we've got this audition for you. We don't quite know what it is. We don't have a script. Just go to this casting office. And um, I was like, but I'm doing this show. And they said, Francis, it's a movie. Just, just go. Mm -hmm. So I went, they had a couple scenes for me. And all it said was that this character um, had a full on Southern accent. Mm -hmm. which I had never done before. So I was like, oh, okay, let's, let's try on my best Forrest Gump. And mm -hmm. I, I went in there and I read with the director and for the first time ever um, in an audition uh, for me, the director, after I read with him, just said, well, I'm convinced. Can you be in Atlanta um, next year by such such date? Right there in the room. So I, I, I gave him a non-committal kind of like, I, I, I'm working on a show. Let, let, me, let me talk to my agents about, about all of this. Mm -hmm. And I called them right away and they said, well, of course you can do it. Francis, it's a movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll get you out of that other show and you'll do this. So um, it took a while for Warner Brothers to approve the casting. And a month later I was down in Atlanta doing this movie. So, um, um, I was really, really green. I didn't know anything about shooting a movie or what it meant to rehearse a, a musical movie. It was, it was called um, Joyful Noise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, first day I'm on set with Dolly Parton and Queen Latifah and, you know, just amazing, amazing people. Um, and um, I just love being a student. So I just watched them. I saw how, it, how I, I learned in the process of doing it by making mistakes and asking questions and being respectful and, or trying to be. And, um, um, and so that's how, when I had an audition, my very first audition for this new show called Madam Secretary, mm -hmm. I knew that um, on the day of the audition, I just had, that was my opportunity that day to act. That's all to work. Yeah. And I went into the audition with no expectations. The casting director said, this, this role might recur. We don't know, you know, it, it all depends. Mm -hmm. um, um, all I knew was finally I was in a character who was Asian, who actually had authority. I, I had had a lot of roles where I played an Asian without authority, mm -hmm. um, but thought they did. 
Um, and, and finally, here was a guy who actually had all of China, mm-hmm. you know, behind him. So why shouldn't he throw his weight around? And, and, um, and, and I got to read with Eric Stoltz, who was a hero of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so, and, but he was so, so nice. And um, uh, I, it, was, it, it was just fun to be in there and let's just do this scene and, you know, um, and the very first day that we shot was this big scene with like 200 extras and the entire principal cast was there. And so suddenly I'm in, a, you know, I'm in a scene with Taya Leone and B.B. Newworth and, you know, people that I just, Eric Bergen, you know, people that I just really admire, but I'm supposed to be the one to tell them off and stomp off. So I just kind of, watched how things were being done. They asked me, like, where do you want to stand? How do you want to do the scene? You know, stuff like that, which had never happened before. And I thought, well, either they're asking and they really want an answer, yeah. a, a suggestion from me, or it's a, it, it's a trick question and they really don't, <laughs> they want to see whether I'm an asshole. <laughs> and I decided just to, to give them an offer and not be, a dick about it not to say this is how it has to go for me yeah. you know but to say well how about we start over here and that means that i get to leave that way is, is that okay with you and they were like great 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 so the camera blocked and i i did the scene and it it turns mm-hmm. out that um because this character was so stern and and um uh, and so uh brusque with taya mm-hmm. uh, in the first scene that the crew thought that i was like a really tough guy yeah. for a lo- for a while, and, and it took a couple more episodes before they 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 realized that I'm just you know me, and mm. it's just the character. Um, I learned a lot by doing a, a, a role that recurred throughout a series, and what that means to have a character arc through a series or a season even, um, and not just within an episode, um, and. and um, it was a happy set and everyone from the first season to the last was always trying to make it the best show it could be and um, was supportive of, of everyone else, you know, on the set and what they were doing. So I, I, I'm so grateful to them. They, they, they really helped me learn how to be on a set and how to pace myself um, uh, to be ready and um, and um, to be efficient and not waste my energy on things that won't help me, and um, and in the process of that, helped me realize that I might have aspirations for camera work as well as theater. Although theater continues to be the bulk of my work. That was a very long answer to a very short question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> This, it's beautiful, but I, I did not want to, uh, to interrupt. Um, I do have follow-ups uh, on oh, sure. what you've mentioned, but it's, at least to me, uh, it is so evident that when a person loves what they're doing and is open to the universe, then the universe takes care of everything else because all of these opportunities were created the the universe came and grabbed you and put you in you know uh situations and you had to fully embrace it and you had to be open to it and you had to do your work but that's how it's supposed to be and that's open to mistakes too open to failing yeah Um, because that's how you learn to pick yourself up it's how you learn to do something else or, or <coughs> excuse me, or to add to what you had been doing. Yeah. So, you know, there are plenty of times um, I've made just stupid mistakes. The first time I was ever on an episodic show, mm-hmm. it was Law and Order SVU. And there's Mariska Hargitay, who is just such a, a beautiful woman and mm-hmm. a great actor. And she's just a pro. She knows how to work. And my very first scene was running down, you know, this hospital 
hallway with iced tea on a gurney and, and then stopping outside the emergency room and having to stop her from coming in so that we can work on her. I uh, work on uh, iced tea, that is. Mm -hmm. And the director said, okay, you're, you, you have this dialogue, you're running down here, the gurney will turn the corner <coughs> over there. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And then you stop on this mark and you deliver those last lines to Mershka. But when you stop her, don't touch her. I don't want you to touch her. Mm -hmm. I was like, um, okay, I wasn't planning on, you know, yeah touching her, but okay. So first take, got the dialogue, all this medical jargon, I'm running down the hallway, stop on that marker, turn around, and she bowls right into me, trying to get into that room because she wants to, she wants, she's concerned for iced tea. Yeah. And I, I, I like yell, cut, cut, cut. Francis, you have to stop her. I was like, oh, okay, 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 okay. All right, so we do it again. Everything you know has to track all the way back to first marks and down the hallway and, and extras and all that kind of stuff. Run back down, turn around. She pulls right into me again, and the director goes, "Cut, cut, Francis! You have to stop her." And I was like, "Oh, okay. I'm, I'm so, I'm so sorry." Mm. So I'm going. I, I think to myself, how, how, how if I'm not supposed to? So I go up to her. Put, put and, a gurney between the two of you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I say to Mershka, Mershka, I'm really, really sorry about have, uh, you know, them having to you know, stop the scene. You're doing such amazing work and I'm, I'm so in awe of you, but I, they, they're telling me that I have to stop you here. And she said, well, what if you, you know, just put your hand on my shoulder to stop me? And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. They told me that I can't touch you. Yeah. And she was like, what? Mm -hmm. All you had to do was come to me and say. And so she went to the director <laughs> on my behalf. Wow. And I learned, I learned on that day, you know, I'm a person too, you know, it, it, and, I'm, it, and I may just be here for the day and she's been on this show for 20 years. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, if I think I need something, all you have to do is ask and maybe the answer is no, but then you'll learn something. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I, I learned on that first day that if, if, if my objective is to stop her here, you know, have a conversation with her about how that should happen yeah. so that you're not violating, you know, personal space without having asked mm -hmm. first. Um, but also like, so that you have a, uh, an idea of you know how to work with one another um so yeah uh failing is something that is terrifying to me and and i kick myself all the time uh, about mistakes i've made but you learn you, you 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 can learn so much from mistakes yeah absolutely and good again good on you for for going and asking because mm -hmm. Uh, if you didn't, it, it would, you know, the same thing would have happened over and over again until the director, you know, might have been uh, really upset with you. So uh, yeah. good, yeah. good for you. Um, going to, uh, to what you mentioned in terms of uh, Taya and, and others have taught you uh, many things. What were some of those things that you're, you have started utilizing uh, since that time? Taya is not just a really wonderful person and a great actress mm -hmm. who can be honestly funny and um, dramatic and um, have such authority and vulnerability all at the same time. She's just, I, I think she's remarkable um, to me um, and one of the nicest people on set. She also is really great at understanding how um, it, it, how to work on camera and what it means when you're the one leaving the scene as opposed to somebody else leaving the scene. What it means uh, when you pass one another. How to how to block a scene so that the blocking 
doesn't just help you and your character. It's not just about that. It's about how shots are set up. Um, and there were many, many times when we, I finally got on set with her and we were um, uh, running through lines just before camera blocking, when she'd say, you know what? I think this scene should be, needs to end on you. I think the important story here mm -hmm. is to wonder how this is affecting you at the end of this scene. So instead of you walking out, I'm going to walk out and so that the camera can stay on you. Mm -hmm. And there were so many times she was so generous. You know, she's the star of the show. Everything is always written to end on her, right? It's mm -hmm. all about her winning ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, but, but she, because of her suggestions, um, uh, uh, she gave me certain shots. Um, and that not only helped the story of that episode, that not only helped highlight me as a person, as an actor, but it also helped create a relationship between the two of us over the course of a season and of, yeah, you know, five seasons of the show. Yeah. Um, so that it became not just constantly over and over again about she's the American Secretary of State, so ultimately I'm wrong and she's right. Um, although often that happens, there right. were times when I went up to her, mm -hmm. when, when China got the better of her. So yeah. this constant kind of, um, and there were times when, especially at the beginning, when I dismissed her because she's a woman, I dismissed her because she's American, I dismissed her for all, all, so many different things. Yeah. But she offered me the opportunity um, to learn about America, about women, about her, about myself, um, by, by having the opportunity to have certain kinds of uh, reactions to what she was doing, that it wasn't always about her. And that was, you know, I, you know, being a, 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 a guest on the show, it was never, I think, my role to make the suggestion that I think this camera should end on me, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying that anybody should ever do that. Yeah. But you know, when you are a principal on a show, mm -hmm. sometimes you know that character and you know the, the, your story mm -hmm. better than a lot of other people. At least you're the one paying attention to that or should be. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you can, in certain circumstances, make those kinds of suggestions. And I, I, I learned that from Taya. I, I think she was generous, um, but also really, really smart about how to make that show um, interesting and full of uh, real conflict and, mm -hmm. and not just in a particular episode, but over the course of, you know, months mm -hmm. and years. Yeah, and uh, by the way, you know, when you were talking about kind of the, the camera being on you as opposed mm -hmm. to, uh, to you walking out of the shot, Immediately, I thought of uh, you know uh, Chan with the VR uh, machine um, yeah. that ended on you. She walked out, and again, it's it's that the authority, it's that back and forth that you had that I found so enjoyable, and mm -hmm. the overall arc to where both of them came as as characters, you know, mm -hmm. especially in season five, and then uh, finally in season six, it was really really uh, gratifying. And um, I, what I found most interesting about the show, uh, there were actually two things that I, that I found that, I, that made it one of my favorite shows ever. And the reasons for it is one, it gave me an alternate universe to live in that is very mm. much like our reality, but that gets better ending. Uh, mm. Where the problems that we're encountering are the same problems that we're seeing, but we actually get to do something about them and resolve mm -hmm. them in a positive manner. So it mm. gave me that hope <laughs> for, yeah. for, a better, uh, for a better outcome. Uh, so that was one. And the second one was that it wasn't just focused on uh, Elizabeth's work, that it was just as focused on Elizabeth's family. And that, those two dynamics, uh, I think that was the heart of the show, 
of mm -hmm. seeing and I am married to a uh, beautiful, intelligent, smart um, wife who is a executive. So mm -hmm. I saw so many parallels and I, I appreciated my wife even more having watched that show mm -hmm. because I get a chance to see her being vulnerable, both my, my wife, Janice and Elizabeth uh, in the show. I see them being vulnerable and I see them being exceptionally strong. And I just love that part of the show. Uh, the kids, obviously, you know, seeing all of the, all the problems you can be, you know, uh, as, as Elizabeth, you could be preventing a war with China and Russia, and at the same time dealing with what's happening with your son and him not wanting to go to college. It's yeah. life. And yeah. that just made the show so much more enjoyable, and I, it will always be in my top ten. And I think that the fact that it was focusing on a woman, yeah, balancing all those things. I, I you know, I try to. I don't watch everything, but when I when I think of women lead, yeah. women led shows and and on TV. Um, where they're balancing, where you get to know how they're balancing both who they are at work and what they need to do when they're at home. You know, I, I, I think of Mary Tyler Moore. Uh, there are very few other examples, I think, yeah. where you, you really get to know um, it, uh, how women have to cope with all, all of those kinds of things, I think was, was just great. And one of the re reasons why the show was as successful as it was. Um, I also, you know, it, it, in, after the first season, I think, mm -hmm. um, I was at a party where a woman asked to be introduced to me. Mm -hmm. And I learned that she actually was a diplomat, that she had served in the Obama administration and that she, uh, had served in Europe and um, she ha was a fan of Madam Secretary. Mm -hmm. So I got to ask her, you know, how, how realistic was it? Or is it just, you know, TV? And she said, what, what is shocking and surprising and also a little scary is how realistic it actually is. Mm -hmm. That um, so many times, huge issues, world changing issues are handled simply by people in a room, just these are the people who are assigned to be in a room mm -hmm. and they can be, you know, very competent, they can be knowledgeable or they can be just totally ignorant. Mm -hmm. They could be impetuous and, and, you know, not great negotiators. You know, it, it all depends. And sometimes there's chemistry and that just helps mm -hmm. or exactly the opposite of chemistry. And, nothing gets done and it's not because you know something the, the outcome is right or wrong or better for the world or not it's just because these two people don't get along that's how yeah. you know it, things actually do get done uh, and, and I, I, that was shocking to me um mm -hmm. but i think people who watched the show who are fans of the show um recognized that um and um like you said loved that at least for that hour, yes. that kind of conflict, um, you could have a, uh, the hope of a happy ending, yeah. or at least a productive ending. Yeah, um, it's, and, and again, this is why uh, towards the end, you had real uh, secretaries of state in the same room, in the scene, which I found fascinating. And from, yeah. a, pure, from a pure acting perspective, I thought it was so brilliant because you see people, uh, you know, like Colin Powell, and you see, you know, Madeleine Albright, and you see Hillary Clinton. Mm. These are real people, they're not actors. And you know they're not actors because in the beginning where they had to act, you see that they're great people. I'm so happy to see them, but they're not actors. As mm. soon as they started talking uh, about, uh, you know, the, 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 the topic at hand, and I think it was, you know, how does Elizabeth handle a particular situation? Mm. Um, they were being themselves and then you could not tell that they were not actors because they were so real and for me it was such a takeaway of 
it's not about being an actor. It's not about technique. It's about, are you real in that moment or are you not? Are people going to buy you as uh, that character at that uh, moment or they won't? And mm. you don't have to have any training, just be real. And that, that, was, that was a great uh, takeaway, but I, I know that the show was enormously popular now with them because it, it was, again, so truthful. And I think, you know, Morgan uh, Freeman and uh, all of the writers and all of the producers and Eric, you know, they did uh, a tremendous job. I really, really, really enjoyed it. Tremendous, yeah. I, yeah. You know, I, I think I learned too on the set of Madam Secretary, not having trained in it before, um, having watched clips of, you know, television or, or camera acting classes and stuff like that mm -hmm. and trying to make sure that, you know, I knew what certain terms like eyeline mean or, you know, reverse the shot, you know, stuff like that. There are so many things I still don't really know, but I was like, oh, okay, I'll stand over here now, you know. Um, but um, I learned that in terms of just being real, it's not about getting people to believe that you are who you are. It's about me getting to believe that I would, I would react this way if I were in these circumstances, I would say this exactly the way it's written because I'm, you know, I understand where I'm coming from. It's really just about that kind of work. Um, and then trusting that as opposed to, okay, the camera's over there now, so I need to do this and I need to do that. Um, and if you're, if you're wrong, if, if you're, you know, if, if, if they're te technical, if there's something technically that you're doing that is wrong, they'll tell you, yeah. you know, yeah. um, because there's a lot of money flying out the door constantly um, when these things are happening and they need to get the shot. So they will tell you that you can't move, you know, way over here, you know, stuff like that. So you you got to stay over here. So um, uh, uh, I was luck. I, I was just, I've been very lucky, but with Madam Secretary, I was really really fortunate to have people who were really nice about yeah. saying, you know, what they needed from me as well. So, uh, and, and so I learned a lot from them. Yeah. And I, I can honestly say that I'm a better husband because of Tim Daly and uh, <laughs> him playing the character. Um, <laughs> and I use it, uh, you know, we're not going to go into detail, but you know, my wife had uh, something that happened at work and again, she's, mm. she's an executive. Um, and she is about to deal with this enormous uh, juncture at where the company is and what has to be done about it. Mm. And I, I 100%, I go back and I remember, okay, so this is what happened when Elizabeth was dealing with this and it was really traumatic. What am I supposed to be doing? I am supposed to not be the problem. I am supposed to just support her and go through it. I, it's, it, it's not just a show that uh, was beneficial to me as a viewer. It's a wow. show that was beneficial to me as a human, as a father, as a husband, and as an actor. So it's, it's, it's all facets of the show that, uh, that have been uh, just wonderful, wonderful for me. Thanks for saying that. Yeah. Um, now, uh, some interesting things that, again, you, you, um, uh, you know, your parents are Chinese. Um, I, I love that the show was actually using people from uh, the, I, I, I think always or almost always, they were trying uh, very hard to use people that match, uh, you know, the background and the country uh, that they're from. Um, hmm. So you're, uh, you know, a Chinese American. Playing somebody um, who is a foreign secretary, who um, is very powerful, but you're dealing with some really kind of touchy uh, subjects, including, um, you know, again, what happened in China of uh, him deciding, not him as in the, the president of China, deciding to stay president for as long as he wants to. So mm -hmm. you're dealing with all of these things that have, you know, real world reflections and, and consequences. What was it like as a person and was there any blowback from China or from anybody watching saying, 
well, you're not representing us in the way that we see uh, China, because China is very, very careful about how they're being presented. Did you have any of those experiences? Wow, that's a really interesting question. I, if there was blowback yeah. uh, or a negative response to how I was playing the foreign minister, I, mm -hmm. I never heard it. Good. Um, I did hear from a lot of um, uh, fans and, and friends, um, many of whom are also Asian, who mm -hmm. took pride in the fact that there was this character that I played who had dignity, mm -hmm. um, um, but wasn't, you know, stentorian, was actually a human being mm -hmm. who also had feelings, who mm -hmm. had conflicting thoughts, who uh, was sometimes himself between a rock and a hard place, who had a daughter um, who... Um, I love that. Uh, sorry for... One of my favorite episodes, one of my hardest episodes, because I had to speak so much Mandarin in it, and I don't speak Mandarin. So okay. they hired a dialect coach, mm -hmm. uh, this brilliant, savantish guy who speaks dozens and dozens of languages. Um, and um, the guy playing my chief of staff Mm -hmm. um, actually uh, was uh, born in Beijing. And so he was able to tell me, uh, as well as the dialect coach, whether my pronunciation actually sounded like Beijing dialect or not, and or whether it actually made sense, the, ton the tones made sense or, or not. Um, so uh, they were really, really helpful. But that was, there was so much um, added stress because of that. Um, I, I know, I, and, but even, even with that episode where I had to speak so much Mandarin, I did not get, I, I didn't hear of any blowback. Um, Good. Um, I, I did not, again, kind of going in my mind and thinking through all of the, uh, you know, scenes and all of the things that you had to deal with uh, on the show. I didn't see any moments where China would say, okay, this is not what we want to be represented as. Yeah. But being them so particular, I wanted to ask that question. Um, that's great. That, that's, that's great to hear. Um, and I really love, I was going to be mentioning the daughter. I really love that they kept on adding more, um, more depth uh, to, uh, to Ambassador Chan or Foreign Minister Chan, excuse me, that they continue adding the heart and then again where that arc uh, ended um, with <laughs> Elizabeth kind of using that to her advantage but uh, yeah. in, in, in a right way um, yeah. it was it was really I'm so happy that they did uh, season six that yeah. they you know wrapped uh, these things up um, we if they had just left it where it was at season five we'd always be wondering what it's like. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very happy the network allowed it and uh, it worked out. I am Me too. very upset that it ended. Um, I miss know. it so much. <laughs> but maybe they'll come back again right now. You know, a lot of the conversations between uh, Chen and Elizabeth were over Skype uh, kind anyway. So <laughs> they, they could have made things work. <laughs> it, could, it could work, you know, who yeah. knows? Who knows? I, I, for the time being, I'm, I'm just grateful. I'm, I, I never thought, um, I, I never, you know, thought to have, or I never had expectations. Um, I, I'm so grateful that it lasted as long as it did. And it's a great, you know, um, it's a great binge watch too. I mean, yeah. I, I watched it, you know, every week. So, Mm -hmm. uh, but but when you binge watch it, I think there are things that you notice that I, I hadn't noticed the first time around. Uh, even somebody who was you know occasionally mm -hmm. in there, I, I I give the the writers producers all credit for um, really thinking long form. I mean, really long form, and mm -hmm. um, and being prescient about so many things that are happening in the country right now. Yeah, um, yeah, it's. It was, it was one of those again, a very impactful shows on many levels. That um, that right now, I highly suggest for people to binge it because it is far better than turning on the news and seeing what's happening in the world. Oh God, I kind of have to dose myself. You know, I, I can get yeah. 
in, in this much and then I know that I need to turn to HGTV for a little bit, you know, stuff yeah. like that. And um, again, this has nothing to do with, well, it has a little bit to do with acting, but, uh, you know, in our environment, uh, being that uh, you're a Chinese American, uh, seeing all the volatility in our country and having COVID on top of that, I've seen other actors and uh, uh, people of Asian uh, origin um, getting a lot of negativity thrown at them because we keep on hearing the ignorance uh, from the pulpit. Um, have you had, I hope not, but have you had any negative experiences where people were taking some of the things that they hear on TV literally and expressing them towards you? I personally, I've only had one incident okay. where I was walking down the street mm -hmm. and a person who was walking towards me on the, uh, on the same side of the sidewalk, um, as he passed me, kind of lunged at me mm -hmm. and uh, screamed China virus in my face. I was wearing a mask, he was not. Um, and, and, but, you know, thank, and I was so shocked by that, yeah. um, uh, that I just kept walking. Uh, and, uh, and he did too. By the time I got to the corner, I, I, I slowly turned around to make sure that he wasn't following me. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had just kept on walking too. Um, so it was just this one random incident, um, but, I know that there are social justice groups who are tracking um, reports of um, anti-Asian violence uh, and mm -hmm. harassment. Um, and there are thousands of incidents. And these are just the, the incidents where people were willing to report. So mm -hmm. I, I don't doubt that there are many more um, incidents. Um, there are even just here in New York incidents where people are, are assaulted, are, uh, have an acid thrown on them. You know, I mean, it's, it's really, um, but it's really not something new. You know, the, the COVID has focused our attention on it and there may be a spike in incidents right now, but there have always in this country, um, there's always been a, a barrier between um, Asian Americans and um, the perception of full-fledged citizenship. Um, we, unlike some other immigrants to this country, mm -hmm. uh, don't blend in as easily to the um, white mainstream um, media or um, power. Um, and, and so there are still, you know, glass ceilings for Asian Americans, not just in um, our business, but in other businesses, in all businesses as well here in, in the States. Um, there, there are still, you know, calls. Uh, it's, it's, you know, when I go on stage, one of the first things that I know that I have to do as part of my job is to convince people that I'm an actual human being um, so that they can see the character as the character and not simply as a representative of some foreign culture, whether it's an exotic culture or a threatening culture or just an other culture. Um, I, I have to, you know, when I go to see a play that focuses on a white person's story. I don't assume that all white people are like that person. Um, but typically when you see an Asian person in a story, you start suddenly to make assumptions about all other Asian people based on that performance. Um, and so uh, I, you know, I, I think that that is something that um, is peculiar to being uh, Asian American um, still. And so, you, you know, this rise in um, anti-Asian sentiment, 
um, is something that I think most Asian Americans would say they've, they've coped with their entire lives. Um, they know that when they enter a room, the assumption, you know, the assumption isn't necessarily that they belong there um, or that they are entering a group where they are one of the group. Um, uh, when I was growing up, my parents said, you know, you have to be twice as good just to be even because you're Chinese. That's just the way of the world right now. So gird yourself for that, be ready for that and just work harder. And you know, that, that's tough advice. It's realistic advice, but it's also tough advice because you know, everyone else doesn't even have to think about that. When you start a class and you know, there are so many people in that class who don't even have to consider, am I entering this class with an A that I then, you know, if I make a mistake, whittle down? Or, or am I starting this class as a D because they assume, uh, you know, something about me? Um, and it, it, that's something that people of color have to deal with all the time. That's something that women have to deal with a, a, a lot. So, you know, um, uh, yeah, I, I think that um, the, the, in addition to many, many other um, inequities yeah. in our country, COVID and this pandemic and the shutdown have highlighted um, what it means to be Asian American, um, even now. And um, I think that now is a, a real flexion point where um, because of you know, horrific and very public um, incidents like the murder of George Floyd, and uh, Breonna Taylor and many, many others. Um, social justice is uh, really on the agenda. And uh, we're at a, a point right now where we can, where it really is possible to make substantive changes um, or to, to double down on something that is, is really antithetical to what I believe America is all about. Um, and we're at a point where we could go in either direction. So, um, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's a scary time. It's hearing you talk about it uh, again. Uh, I'm white. I'm an immigrant. I wasn't born here. I came here at 14. Why would me being a white male uh, make me more entitled and make me more accepted rather than somebody who was born in this country? and who uh, speaks better English than I do, and who, as you've mentioned, you know, uh, Mandarin is not something that, uh, that you speak, but people make assumptions. Why are we so ignorant? And it makes me, uh, I, I understand what it feels like because I come from a Jewish background, and that's what we ran away from uh, when we came to the United States because uh, you know, grades were, were lowered, uh, couldn't get uh, certain jobs, uh, mm. couldn't get into different universities because you're a Jew. Um, you know, discrimination was very, very open. Um, <clears throat> I remember as a kid, I, I ran home because I think I was second grade and the kids were yelling, you're a Jew to me. And I had no oh. idea what it meant. And I ran to my parents and said, they keep calling me this thing. I don't know what it means. What, what is it? And they had to explain that to me because we were not religious. It just, you know, you have a stamp on your passport and it says, you know, what nationality. And in Russia, nationality is not where you were born. It's your, you know, kind of uh, your religion or your ethnicity. Mm. No, I understand it. I, I understand how idiotic it is. Um, but I, it's just, it's so foreign to me that we would continue to treat people like this, especially in the United States where there is everybody is here of every color of every um, you know cultural background of different uh, genders of different sexual orientations who cares why, why wouldn't we be embracing the diversity i i i, I don't know is is it I, i'm not trying to elevate myself but this is just such a foreign concept to me of why would i 
be looking at a person differently because they're Asian uh, or because they're black or because they're gay. Why, I don't even, it, it doesn't really even click. It's, is this a nice person or is this a asshat? Um, and that's, that's an easy choice. I can make that and uh, sometimes it's not. You know, many people are great at pretending to be something that they're not. But why do I care of what a person looks like or what they sound like or their accent or what, how consequential is that part of the equation? Mm. It's not at all. Like, is this a nice person or is not a nice person? That's it. Mm. Why, why can't we make it as simple as that? Why, why do we have to worry about all of these other intangibles, which by the way, you know, if you're born black, you're black. Did you have a choice in being born any other color? No. If you're gay, you're gay because that's how you were born. It's like, what, what are we talking about? That's the part that I just want to shake people sometimes and say, what are you focusing on? Why is this important to you? I, I don't I think, get it. Yeah. In, in this country, I think that there, there's actually a really big difference in um, how some people think mm -hmm. we define ourselves as Americans. And um, for some people, it, it has to do with fitting into an American family tradition. And it has to do with assimilation uh, to a norm that is in their minds the ideal. And then for other people, it's about how different we actually are. Mm -hmm. And still, um, and, and still we're all in the same human family. Um, that we actually do have different cultures, different experiences, different likes and dislikes. Um, and, uh, and still, uh, and, that the, and that the story of America is that its founding principles, which benefit, which originally benefited a, a very small group of people, yep. uh, that, that those um, benefits, those rights and responsibilities get expanded to include more people. And uh, that that's the story of America. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, we all have prejudices. We all have likes and dislikes. Mm -hmm. We all um, make assumptions about about each other um, based on whatever data we get from them. But um, we all also um, the miracle of you know this culture is that we also have the capacity to see what we have in common and to and and to find value in different stories. Um, and to, to see that um, being human is not defined by one kind of story. Um, and it, it, it's got a, a multitude of stories. Um, so we're at a point right now where we're being confronted by those kinds of questions um, very uh, directly. And how we answer that, those questions right now is going to, I think, really determine what kind of country we're in, what kind of industry we're in, what kind of stories we tell for the next generations. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it, it, these are these are big these are big issues, but uh, and and they can be complicated mm -hmm. um, because we're so diverse. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I also think that we have the capacity to be that inclusive as well. Francis, um, you were playing a diplomat, but you are. <laughs> uh, I, I, I definitely think if you like, there is a future in, uh, in, in, uh, in serving your country. I don't think my blood pressure could take it. Well, that's uh, one of the reasons why I don't do it is because I'm definitely not uh, going to handle it well. Yeah, telling um, stories is, a, is sort of safe, you know. Yeah. Um, real life is, is, is much, much riskier. Yeah, well, um, 
it's it's been an enormous joy and privilege to uh, to speak with you. I really, really wanted to have a conversation with uh, with an actor I admired, not knowing the person, and I'm walking away admiring the person a hundred percent more. So thank you so much, Alan. Um, I, I I'm really flattered that you thought of me, and I'm grateful for our chat. Yeah, likewise. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Uh, as you know, we love acting and people as much as you do. And this is why we do this for you. So please be safe. Please be kind to yourself and to others. And let's use the examples and the words that we heard mentioned so eloquently by Francis and try to choose the path of being the society that we can be not what we used to aspire to. Thank you. Thank you so much.